Good morning and welcome. Um, we're delighted that you've joined us uh, in order to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today. Um, uh, just a little note as you're about to begin, you might want to hit the pause button right away depending on things if you read the little email, but we are going to celebrate communion today and so if you, uh, yeah, I'd encourage you to maybe if you haven't got your stuff already to hit the pause button, go grab yourself some fruit of the vine and uh, some bread of some kind and uh, and so that you're ready for when that point of the service comes. Also, I'm quite sure you all know that the provincial government has extended restrictions banning um, gathering for worship um, and in light of that, you know, uh, I just want to make sure you know that like I expect people to struggle. I'm struggling. <laughs> And so if you're struggling with anything, um, we please call us. I mean, it, we don't have the opportunity on Sunday's morning to notice if you're missing or look at you and see that something's bothering you or you're troubled. Um, um, so please, if you call us, uh, we would love to hear from you. Call me. Um, uh, we just want to make sure that we stay in touch. And I encourage you even to call each other. Um, you know, if there's somebody from the church who's on your mind, give them a call. Uh, it's just something that we're going to need to do over the next four weeks. Um, and uh, you'll have an opportunity to do something like that uh, right after this service, if you wish. Uh, we will have our prayers of the community on Zoom at 11.45 a.m. today. And even if you don't have a prayer request or to share, I encourage you to maybe for the first time try joining and it just gives you an opportunity to see us and see each other and, um, and to come into the Lord's presence uh, together. All right, well, with that being said, why don't we come into the Lord's presence together at this time by hearing the word of the Lord in our call to worship this morning. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 68, uh, and it's the beginning and the end of that psalm because it's really long, but uh, these is verses 1 to 6 and then 32 through 35. May God arise, may his enemies be scattered, may his foes flee before him. As smoke is blown away by the wind, may you blow them away. As wax melts before the fire, may the wicked perish before God. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God, sing praise to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds, his name is the Lord. And rejoice before him. For he is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. That is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads forth the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. Sing to the Lord, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praise to the Lord, to him who rides the ancient skies above, who thunders with mighty voice. Proclaim the power of God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the skies. You are awesome, O God. In your sanctuary, the God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. Amen. And now I encourage you, wherever you are, if uh, you're able, please stand with us as we are going to sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Bring forth the roar. 
Please be seated. Would you please bow in prayer with me? Great and loving God, we confess that you are faithful and forgiving, and we ask that at this time you would help us to grasp the greatness of your love. Help us to pray honestly as we now silently make our confession and seek your forgiveness. Merciful God, unlike us, you are true to your word. And when we cry to you in sorrow and repentance, you hear our cries and are swift to forgive. For your faithful love, we praise you, both now and forevermore. Amen. To everyone who has become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, God has spoken these words in his word. He says, I have swept away your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like a mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, let us accept the act of God's on our behalf and return to fullness of fellowship in him. Amen. At this time, I encourage you to continue to worship the Lord in song. If you pause this video and look underneath it, you'll see links to some worship songs as well as a link to a children's song if you have kids with you. And when you're finished, you can unpause and we'll continue. Welcome back. Uh, Now at this time, we are going to offer up our prayers of the community. Uh, This is our opportunity to bring our thanksgivings and our requests before God um, in the presence of his spirit and in recognition that we are his people. Um, So I'm going to open a prayer. I will offer some petitions and some thanksgivings, and then I'll leave a little bit of room for you to pause your video, and you can offer up your own prayers and thanksgivings at that time. When you're finished, unpause the video, and I'll close the prayer. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we come to you, and we ask that you would open our eyes. Father, we ask that we would be able to see the world as your son Jesus sees it, so that when we walk through the valley of darkness, we might know that you are present with us. We might know that you are stronger than any foe that comes against us, and that we might walk in joy, even in the midst of what the world sees as terrible trial. Father, we give you thanks that you know our needs before we even ask you. And we also give you thanks that you have the power to satisfy our needs and our desires with good things, that nothing can stop you from doing that. And so we trust you, and we come and we ask that you would give us your spirit and that you would satisfy us deep inside our hearts. Heavenly Father, We also ask that you would give us the gift of patience, especially during this time in which there are many oppressive things, both fear of disease, fear of corruption, fear of the abuse of power, fear of being separated and being alone. Father, we ask that you would strengthen us and that despite these things that oppress us, you would enable us to reach out to one another in the ways that we can and that we would glorify you by our acts of love towards each other. For we recognize that your son has taught us that as we care for each other, we are actually loving and caring for him. Father, we also ask that you would make us bold in declaring the good news about your son Jesus Christ in all the ways that we can. Father, may we be bold in letting people know that he is the king in a world where there are so many angry over the injustice of the present rulers and governments. Father, may they find true rest, peace, and life in your Son, Jesus Christ. And may we be made faithful and bold in declaring him as the one in which that is found. Heavenly Father, in this knowledge, 
we don't want to miss out on the benefits of belonging to your son ourselves. And so we are going to come now with our own personal requests and our personal thanksgivings to you at this time. Gracious God, we thank you that you hear our prayers, that you see all that is happening with true sight, and that you have the power to guide us into life through your anointed one, Jesus Christ. May you glorify him in all things and pour out your spirit on your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time, if you have kids with you, uh, you're more than welcome to pause the video and set them up with uh, Lifeway Kids or whatever resource you might be using. Um, and I'd like to invite Ruth to come and read scripture for us. Good morning. <clears throat> the scripture reading today is the 17th chapter of First Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's the story of David and Goliath, so you might be familiar with it. I encourage you to listen or to read along um, for some of the details that maybe you hadn't really noticed before. <clears throat> now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soka in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes, Damon, between Soka and Azekah. Solomon the Israelites assembled the camp in the valley of Elab and drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and, his iron, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man you have, uh, and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your servants. But if, an over, if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judea. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was old and well advanced in years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend the father's sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are all with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock with the shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. 
As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from behind his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He keeps, comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done to the man who kills the Philistine and removes his disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Elab, David's um, oldest brother, heard him speaking, and the men, he uh, burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you come? Uh, did you leave these few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done? said David. Can I... Can't I even speak? Then he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and will fight him. <laughs> Saul replied, You are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. And he's been fighting a fighting man since he was a youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. This uncircumcised Philistine would be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic he put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I can't go in, in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in his pouch of his shepherd's bag, and... Slung, uh, um, and his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with, uh, with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the um, today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All these gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. 
Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into the forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard, and he killed him. He cut off his head with the sword. Then the Philistines saw that their hero was dead. They turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sergem road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son, whose son is that? this young man. Abner replied, as surely as I live, O king, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story that you have given to us through your word. And Father, we ask that as we explore it and seek to understand it more, that you would open our eyes um, to see the glory of what you do and that we would learn to trust you more and more. We ask this in Jesus' name and for the further fame of his name. Amen. The story of David and Goliath. It is unquestionably one of the most famous and most loved stories from the Bible. And there are many, many things that we can learn from this story. For example, this story teaches us important things about what it means to have faith in God. I've especially appreciated the teaching of Bruce Waltke in this regard. In his regent course on First and Second Samuel, he told a story about playing David and Goliath with his daughter, who was three years old at the time. You know, he was Goliath, and she was David, and she would come and stand on the opposite side of the living room from him, and she would have her little ping pong in her hand. And, uh, and she would, you know, try and throw the ping pong at him and get him to fall. Um, except that he would play it, of course, because he's a Bible scholar. He would say, no, no, you have to say, I trust in God first. If you want me to fall down, you have to say that. So she would come up and she would say, I trust in God. And then she would fling her little ping pong ball and he would go tumbling to the ground and so if she remembered to say I trust in God he would fall down if she didn't he said no 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 you have to say I trust in God but one day while they were playing um, she came up and she went I trust in God but she didn't throw the ping pong ball and so she said daddy I said I trust in God you have to fall down and instinctively Bruce replied you still need to throw the ball honey and in saying that, he realized that that was the same for David, and it's the same for us. You see, faith isn't just believing that God can defeat Goliath. Faith must also display itself in action, in actually walking up to the giant everyone else fears and throwing the stone, doing the act of obedience that God has called us to. So this famous Bible story tells us a lot about faith, about what it means to trust in God. But as much as it tells us about faith, and it does tell us a lot, it actually tells us even more about God himself and what God is up to in the world. In fact, without first looking to God and seeing what he's doing, we can't possibly have faith like David's. 
For David is not the anointed one, literally the Messiah of his day, because of his great faith. After all, as Bruce Walke himself points out, no one in the Old Testament had perfect faith. Not even David, and not even in this very story. When battle time comes, even David picks up not one, but five stones. Even David doesn't believe that one stone is enough for God, and yet God still uses him. And I think that should be a real encouragement to you and me in our broken and faltering faith journeys. But my point here is that it's not the faith that's emphasized in this story. The example of faith is present, but the emphasis is clearly on the work of God, who has just poured out his spirit upon David at his anointing. And we see the evidence of this throughout the whole story. For example, only the providence of God himself could have directed affairs so that David arrived at precisely the right time to hear Goliath's challenge and to be ready to respond. And only the Spirit of God could have prepared David for this moment in advance by giving him by his spirit, the crazy courage as a shepherd to go chasing after bears and lions after they'd already got a lamb, attack them with his hands and kill them. You know, David knew this was not his power that was enabling him to do him. And yet God gave him kind of practice in trusting him in risking his life to save a little lamb when no one else was watching and when there was no glory for doing so. And then also only the Spirit of God, which I think you notice more frequent, easily, could have enabled David to sling a stone, especially from such a great distance, and hit Eliath square between the eyes, the only part of his body that wasn't covered in armor. Um, and I think we sometimes miss the distance part here about how far David slings this stone, um, because, simply because we're not familiar with ancient weaponry. Uh, in verse 7, when the author is describing all these, this gear, you know, that Goliath has, and, you know, we get the tank part, you know, that he's, like, wearing 125 pounds. That's, like, the scale armor is 125 pounds. I mean, this, this guy's like a tank. Uh, but when the author describes the shaft of Goliath's spear, which is actually more like a javelin, it's for throwing, he describes it as a, like a weaver's rod. Uh, Walkie and many other scholars point out that this is actually is almost certainly not a description of its size, but rather of the fact that the shaft would have been wound and wrapped with cords and had, would have loops of different like, distances on it. And all of that was uh, for the purpose of accuracy when throwing. In other words, it was evidence that Goliath was very practiced and very skilled at throwing his javelin. In other words, Goliath was a sharpshooter. He was like, you know, kind of like the NHL hockey uh, coach's dream player, right? big guy with hands like Wayne Gretzky. If you get in this guy's range, you're dead meat because he's going to hit you and he's got a 15 pound iron point, which is the latest technology, and it's going to go right through your armor into your heart, right? So if you get in range, you're toast, which means that when David slings his stone at Goliath, he is long, long way away. He is out of distance of however far Goliath can throw his javelin, and I bet you he can throw it pretty far. So in other words, this is literally a long shot for David. And yet, on the first stone, he hits Goliath straight between the eyes. And this is why everyone on the battlefield knows without a doubt that this is happening not because David is good at slinging stones. Everyone instantly knows that this is an act of God, which is why all of the Philistines run. And it's also why the inspired author stops the action right in the middle of describing David putting to Goliath to death to say these words, to point this out. Where in verse 50 he says that David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. In other words, the author is trying to point out that it was God that killed Goliath. That's the point. God killed him. David was simply the instrument God chose to use to get the job done. And this should remind us that God had just, in the previous story, sent his prophet Samuel to anoint David, who then received the Holy Spirit in power. And now David, anointed with the Holy Spirit of the Lord, is used by the Lord as his instrument to kill Goliath. God sent David to do this. He orchestrated the whole thing. Why? <laughs> Why does God want to kill Goliath? Well, for the same reason that God has 
always sent his anointed one in order to save his people. You see, David was not anointed by God in order to point out what a great guy he was or how much faith he had. There are many people who are not anointed like David who had great faith, Abraham being a prime example. And neither was David anointed as some sort of reward that David deserved for doing good things. Rather, David was anointed with the Holy Spirit as part of God's plan to save his people. This is the great conclusion that David himself points out for us, making it the conclusion of both of his speeches in this story. We see this first at the end of his speech to Saul, who tells him that he can't go fight Goliath because he's just a boy, which doesn't mean he's, you know, he's probably around 17. It could mean he's anywhere under 20 is uh, what that word means. <laughs> so he's just young and unexperienced and, you know, doesn't know how to fight, obviously, at least in the traditional way. And so at the end of this speech, justifying himself in front of Saul, this is what he says. He says, The Lord who rescued me or saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. He recognizes that this is about rescue and that I've experienced this rescue. And then he goes on to declare in front of the, at the end of his speech to uh, Goliath the Philistine in verse 47 and apply this to the grand big situation saying, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. In other words, this is not my fight, this is God's fight, and at the end of this, you're all going to know it. So then, God sends his anointed one, literally his Messiah or Christ, as his special instrument to save his people from this threat. And why does God choose to save people through an anointed one? That might be one of the questions we ask. I mean, why does he work this way and not another way? Well, David Samura helpfully points out that the text gives us at least two reasons why God sends David as an, his anointed one to save in this way. And the first reason that we're given is so that the whole world will know that the only true God is the God of Israel. As David declares at the end of verse 46, in the middle of his speech to Goliath, where he says that once the Lord delivers Goliath into his hands, the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. In other words, our God is the God, not your God's. God saves his people through his anointed one to demonstrate to the whole world that there is no other God beside him. And the Philistines watching that day knew without a doubt after this was over at least, that their gods, the gods that Goliath had called upon to curse David, were nothing in comparison with the god that David had called upon. That, therefore, is the first reason that God sends, saves his people through an anointed one, and not another way, is to demonstrate to the whole world that he alone is God. And the second reason is so that the Lord's people themselves would know that the Lord saves his people without any help from them. You see, salvation is not by works, but by the grace and power of God. Not just in the New Testament, but all the way through the Old Testament. As David says in verse 47, it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but the Lord saves by his own power. It is his battle. And therefore, God sends his anointed one, David, to save Israel from Goliath so that the world will know that he alone is God and so that his people would know that the salvation is all by grace. And God's purpose in anointing Jesus with his spirit was no different except for the fact that the salvation that God has brought about through Jesus is infinitely greater than the salvation won by David in his battle with Goliath. When Jesus came up out of the waters of baptism and was anointed with the Holy Spirit of God, God the Father was identifying, marking out, and empowering Jesus as his chosen instrument of salvation. Therefore, through Jesus, God's great anointed one, the Christ, God has accomplished the greatest act of salvation in all of history, everything that's come before and everything that will come far greater than the salvation won by David is the salvation won by Jesus the Christ. For no one demonstrates 
that the Lord alone is God, like Jesus, the risen from the dead Christ, demonstrates it. And no one demonstrates the great grace of God like Jesus, the one who allowed himself to be crucified, Christ does. Jesus is the great instrument of God's salvation. He's the savior of the world. He was set apart by God for this very purpose. And that is one of the main things that is meant when the apostles call Jesus Christ. Therefore, the main goal of this passage is not to show off the faith or even necessarily the character of David, as helpful as that is. I'm not saying it's not helpful. Uh, The main goal, though, is to show off the faithfulness of God, who has not left us, his people, helpless against the enemy, but has rather sent his spirit upon his anointed one, Jesus Christ, to save us so that the world may know that he is God and that we may experience his grace for ourselves. For if all we do in this story is look at David and his faith, we may be tempted, I think wrongly, to think that faith is something that we have to work at or try harder to achieve. But faith doesn't come from trying harder, from comparing ourselves to someone like David and trying to use our own strength to do what he did. Faith, rather, comes from faith fixing our eyes on God, recognizing that everything that happened through David was actually him. It is witnessing God's power and his action by his spirit through his anointed one that enables us to actually follow like David followed. So this morning I'd like to close by trying to just help you grow in faith, not by showing you what a great guy David is, but by drawing your attention to what a great God, the Lord who was with David, is. For the Lord anointed David with his spirit so that the people of God would follow him into the safety of the earthly kingdom of Israel. He was bringing peace to that land through David. And God has anointed his unique son, Jesus, with his spirit so that the people of God, you and me, would follow him into the safety of the eternal kingdom of his father in heaven. And following, my brothers and sisters, requires trust, faith, But what is it that makes Jesus worthy of being followed? Because as we learn those things, I think that's many ways what helps us to actually get out there and do it. And so we should ask ourselves questions. What are things about Jesus that really do help you and me want to trust him even more than we already do? I think that if we take a little bit of time here to look at what the Lord gives to David as a special gift in this story, this earlier anointed one, it can really help us to see one of the very good reasons for trusting Jesus, even in difficult times, even when God asks us to go face giants. And that reason is this. Out of all of the people in this story, only David is given eyes that truly see. And what David sees looks very different from what everyone else sees. But what he sees makes all the difference in what David chooses to do. And this be soon begins to come clear, become clear as soon as we hear David open his mouth, the very first time in this story. You see, David has arrived and the battle lines are drawn and he comes forward to the, near the front of the line and he hears Goliath come out and defy the armies of Israel. And then as he's just heard that, he starts hearing the men among, talk amongst themselves about the great reward that Saul will give to whoever is able to defeat Goliath. This is in around verse 24, if you're following along. And then in response to hearing this, David responds with two questions in verse 26. And the second of these questions is clearly rhetorical and more than a little bit cheeky. (laughs) In the second half of verse 26, we read David talking to all these like veteran warriors saying... Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God, right? Like, you know, uh, and, and we all catch that this is like, you know, he's like, this, uh, that you shouldn't be like this. Um, but what I don't think we see is that I think this means that his first question is also rhetorical. That second question, Jesus really, I mean, David is really saying that 
Look at this Goliath guy. He's not picking a fight with us. He's picking a fight with God. He's nuts. That's what it's saying. But in the first question, I think it should also have the same tone. In verse, uh, he asks the question, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? And when he hears this, you've got to remember that he's already heard it. He's already heard what Saul's reward is. Therefore, he's not expressing interest in earning the reward that Saul is offering. Quite the opposite, I think. I think he's expressing shock that Saul would offer a reward at all. In other words, he sees the offer of a reward as completely unnecessary. This is a rhetorical question. His attitude is not, hmm, I wonder what I can get. But his question is rather like, what? What are you thinking, Saul? No reward is necessary. So I think maybe verse 26 should sound a bit more like this, where it says, David asked the men standing near him, what? What will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And I think this explains why Eliab gets so angry with his little brother, David. <laughs> Since David's questions clearly imply that the soldiers are silly to be afraid, that they are afraid for no reason, that they just don't get it. Uh, <laughs> you know, a teenager coming into a scene like that and saying such things, they can, I can see how that an older brother would get quite upset. <laughs> I also think that's why uh, Saul uh, um, hears about it and summons David. I mean, I can imagine, or maybe you can imagine with me, someone reporting to Saul saying, Hey, Saul, uh, there's this guy who's just arrived uh, who thinks Goliath is nothing to worry about. In fact, get this, he thinks that you shouldn't even be offering a reward to go fight him. You know, that would get a king's attention. <laughs> and both Eliab and Saul's first reaction is that David is simply being cocky that he just doesn't know what he's talking about. But it's in David's reply to Saul in verses 34 through 37 that he shows that he's not being arrogant. He's just seeing things from a radically different perspective. Because David, as he may explain in these verses, knows from firsthand experience that God has the power to save from great powerful beasts, from both the lion and the bear. And he knows that this situation with Goliath is essentially no different. And David's sincerity in this view is confirmed by his decision to refuse Saul's weapons. David knows that I didn't need these things when I dealt with the bear and the lion. I know that God can do it without me having to try and be like other people. Especially in trying to use the kind of weapons that the very guy I'm fighting trusts in, Goliath. And so David simply goes with what he's got, with his staff and with his sling. And I think here's where we get this fine, a final confirmation that it's David is the one who really sees. Um, I don't know if you've wondered this. I've always wondered this since I was a kid. Um, you know, the question of like, why the inspired author includes Goliath's taunt or mocking comment about David coming at him with sticks. I mean, like, I always thought as a kid, like, what a lame insult, Goliath. Like, come on. <laughs> like, why is this in the story? Um, but uh, one of the joyful things I uh, came across this week as I was reading is uh, something that David Sumura pointed out. And I think he nails it here. That the reason why this taunt from Goliath is pointed out or kept in the text is that it reveals that Goliath only sees David's staff, not his sling. In other words, Goliath can't see the weapon that's about to kill him. David can see all of Goliath's weapons, and he knows that they're useless against the Lord, but Goliath can only see David's staff, not his sling, demonstrating that he fails to see the real weapon that's going to strike him down, the arm of the Lord God Almighty. For David, then, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the key thing is that he sees. He sees reality for what it really is. He sees, as he puts it, that the battle is the Lord's. And therefore, from David's point of view, fighting Goliath with a sling and a staff is simply what makes sense, regardless of what everyone else sees. And the outcome of the battle proves that David's vision of reality, as crazy as it seems to everyone else, really is the truth. And my brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ sees much, much more clearly than David ever did. 
As the anointed one, Jesus, more than any other person who has walked the earth, sees things for what they really are. And therefore, one of the surest ways to grow in our faith is to trust what Jesus sees, his vision of reality. As God's anointed, Jesus Christ sees what's really real with a clarity that none of us possess. And I think it's easy for us to slip into being like Eliab or Saul here, to, you know, treat Jesus like, you know, he doesn't really know what he talks about, at least on some occasions, you know, like, yeah, that was just, that's just a little old-fashioned there, Jesus. <laughs> you, you just don't really get what it's like now. But when Jesus says things, he sees, folks. When Jesus says that our real enemies are not other people, but rather sin, the world, and the devil, he means that. Our real enemies are not Republicans, Democrats, or health officers who impose oppressive restrictions, but the forces of evil to whom they are in bondage and need to be freed from. Nor is Jesus joking when he warns us about hell. Just as he isn't joking when he prays in John 17, verse 24, Father, I want those. I want all those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. I mean, soak in that for a while, that Jesus sees and expresses with truth that his great desire, that he wants us with him. Or how about when he prays from the cross in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Or let's finish with this one. The truth that he sees and expresses when Jesus speaks in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 20, and says that all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to me. All of it, brothers and sisters. And then he says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. These are the words of the one who can truly see despite what everything else looks like in the world. That is reality. That's the vision of Jesus, the anointed one, the Christ. He sees things the way they really are. And so the question we're left with is this. Are we seeking to see the world the way Jesus sees it? Are we seeking to adopt his vision of the world? And on the flip side of that, are we aware that the reason why Goliath and all the forces of evil that stand behind him are so frightening to us is actually because we don't see things the way that Jesus sees them. Just like David's point of view on the Goliath situation looked crazy to everyone else, so Jesus' view on things can often look crazy to us. But this story about David and Goliath is meant to teach us that God's anointed one, Jesus Christ, is the one who sees clearly. He's the one who's right, as crazy as what he says might seem to us at times. And so my hope is that in reading this story about David and Goliath, that it will change forever the way you read the stories about Jesus Christ. That when you read the Gospels, you would read them with a prayer in your heart that God would help you to see the world the way Jesus sees it. For when the Spirit helps us to see the world the way Jesus sees it, it really does make it easier to follow him, to walk up to giants and say with confidence, this battle is the Lord's, and then throw the stone. Do the crazy act that God is calling us to do, the act that doesn't make sense in the eyes of the world, but the act that is in tune with reality and the act that God will vindicate in the end. So may you go, and may God give you eyes to see as Jesus sees. Amen. Would you please bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us this story that is so rich, that we can read this story so many times and learn so many things about who you are and what it means to follow you. But Father, our prayer this morning is that you would give us the ability to see the world as your anointed one, Jesus, sees it. For we recognize that this is such a great help in following him. 
And so in your mercy and grace, we ask that by the power of your spirit, you would open us and open our eyes to see the gospels, your word, and to hear the voice of the spirit in a new way, in a way that opens our eyes to reality, the way things actually are, in a face, in a world that is deeply deceived and deeply confused. We ask for this grace in the name of Jesus Christ and for the glory of his name. Amen. This time we're going to sing in response. We're going to sing the first two verses of a very famous hymn. Uh, This is the hymn uh, that Luther wrote, uh, which is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. So we're going to sing the first two verses of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I invite you to please stand with me. you to come to the table. Uh, This is the table of that same Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all, and also the Savior and Shepherd of our hearts. And so I invite you to make things ready at your table, and I'll meet you there. Welcome. We are now no longer at our own tables. Whichever table you may be sitting at is now the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is him, the great anointed one, who is inviting you to eat with him at this time. And this morning I would, uh, you know, usually I say the words that come from 1 Corinthians. This morning I'm going to read the words of Jesus at the Last Supper as they're remembered by the Apostle Matthew. So we read in Matthew... Uh, chapter 27, starting verse 26. That while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Would you please now bow with me as we give thanks to God for the bread? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, your anointed one in the flesh, in body, that he might be the instrument of salvation for us. Heavenly Father, as we come now and we receive from him what is given to us for our salvation, may we receive it in faith, trusting that what Jesus, our Lord and Anointed One, sees really is the way the world is. May you empower us by your Spirit to trust his vision and to follow faithfully in it. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us take this bread together in remembrance of him. Carrying on in Matthew, we read that Then Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying this, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of this vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Would you please bow with me as we give thanks for the cup? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ who willingly shed his blood so that we might enter into a new covenant, a new agreement with you, an agreement which is based on your great grace, the forgiveness of our sins. So, Father, as we receive this, we thank you for reminding us through your Son, Jesus, that we are forgiven. And we thank you for his great word to us, telling us that he is even denying himself. He longs to be with us so much that he is denying himself the taste of wine and the fruit of the vine until the last day when he comes again and when all of his children all of his brothers and sisters, I should say, we will all get to taste it together with him at the great feast on that last day when he returns. So Heavenly Father, as we drink this now, may it fill our hearts with great hope and great encouragement, the confidence that we will one day feast in joy, even if we are weeping at the moment. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us drink this together now in remembrance of him. And now we are going to close by singing the last two verses of the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Would you please stand with me? Above all 
And now may you go in great confidence that Jesus Christ, the anointed one of God, really is the savior of the world. That there is no one who can compare with him and no one who can stand against him. And that he has called you and all those who believe in his name and he will be faithful to begin, complete the work that he's begun in you and bring you safely into his eternal kingdom. Go now in that peace and serve your Lord. Amen.